Hi, today I'm going to teach you how to create seamless photo scan textures using only free software. I will warn you though, although you will get a good final product, it won't meet professional standards. This is because you'll be using primarily Blender and Meshroom to create these textures, and both software are not truly optimized for a texture creation pipeline. Still, the products are good enough for personal use and you'll be able to put them in any scene you want. I will also make sure to clearly explain everything I do in Blender because I know not everyone uses Blender and this is a method I think would be useful for any 3D artist across any platform. In fact, if you have enough expertise in your own software, you might be able to do a lot of this process in there. Another warning, this method produces tiny artifacts and certain textures, which is another reason it's not super suitable for commercial use. Additionally, since we are only using free software, this method will only work with textures that are very cluttered. Things like tiles are difficult because we cannot use the clone stamp tool on multiple layers of a texture at the same time. If you are able to get maybe a student license for a software like Substance Designer, you actually can then start to use uh, clone stamp tools on multiple layers. But since that isn't technically free, I've chosen not to include that in this. And instead, we'll be using GIMP to make things seamless. The way GIMP makes things seamless is by merging the two images by slowly fading them into each other. So it works really well for things like leaves or dirt. We're going to use Blender, GIMP, Meshroom, and Darktable to make five texture maps. A color map, a height map, a normal map, a roughness map, and an ambient occlusion map. You'll also need a camera of some kind. I'm going to use a Canon 60, but anything should work. If you are using a smartphone, make sure to install software that lets you shoot in manual. Now let's get started with the setup. Professional PBR material photographers often use two things that are optional. They have something called a Macbeth color chart and they have rulers. The Macbeth color chart is used in raw image editing software to make sure that the image has been properly white balanced and that colors are consistent with other textures an artist may create. The rulers, commonly 2 meters by 2 meters, are to make sure that people know the scale of textures. This is obviously critical when making textures that are to be used professionally so that people know the scale and so that people can also tell the colors are correct. If you're making these textures just for yourself, then really you don't need a Macbeth color chart, and that's why I don't have one. Still, I used a piece of white paper just to white balance the image, and it's worked pretty well. Of course, it's a little bit jank, but all of this is a little bit jank. I also use four yardsticks just because it helps me visualize everything, and unfortunately, I do not own four meter sticks. Often, I like to shoot later in the evening, just before sunset, or on an overcast day. This is because we want to make sure there are very soft shadows on the terrain you want to photograph. This makes sure that there's very little ambient occlusion on the color map we make, and so that when we apply lights later on in our scenes, there aren't weird artifacts or like extra shadows appearing in certain areas. As you can see, today is kind of got the ideal conditions. Um, it's really cloudy, and since it's like 12-ish, there's a lot of light. Um, and so that's why it's a little better to film today rather than in the evening on like summer because even though you'll get soft light then Unfortunately, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a lot of like variable light. That's also gonna be pretty dim So you're gonna have to make sure that you have uh, have a really really uh, slow exposure um, Unfortunately, it did recently rain. So as you can see the there's a lot of water which does mess with the reflections which will make photo scanning certain areas worse for example right now this road wouldn't be an ideal place to photo scan because it does have a lot of um water on it so it is really reflective when you find somewhere you want to rip a texture you should place down the scales i've created a two by two yard square as you can see here I've got my camera settings to a set white balance that won't change between photos, and I'm using a large f-stop so that I have a wide depth of field, and a low ISO so that I have minimal noise. For anyone familiar with cameras, you will realize that the camera settings and lighting conditions used to produce these textures cause very little light to hit the camera sensor. This is a problem since we want all photos to be sharp and properly exposed. I would heavily recommend the use of a tripod when taking photos for textures, so you can use a long exposure. Make sure that this exposure is constant for all of the photos. We do not want color variation between images because Meshroom needs the colors to be more or less the same when it calculates the parallax between the images. And obviously, color discrepancies could ruin the texture. Of course, if you don't care about noise, you can just crank up the ISO and shutter speed. Obviously, this is just for personal use, so it might not matter. On the other end of the spectrum, if you do care a lot about the quality, make sure you use a lens that has a, as little chromatic aberration as possible. If you do have chromatic aberration though, shoot in RAW so we can fix that in Darktable. 
Once you've set everything up, take a photo of the color chart in your first picture, if you have one, which again, I don't, so I'm just going to take a photo of the white piece of letter paper. And then just take photos in a grid. I often move 5 inches or roughly 10 centimeters between photos to make sure I have a dense grid of photos. How many photos you take depends on how large the texture you're shooting is, but I generally get pretty good results with just 50 to 100 photos for my 2x2 grid textures. In fact, depending on the terrain, I've even got better results with less, so you should really just try to experiment with what you've got. Then, we throw all the photos into Darktable, a free raw image editing software. If you're not shooting raw, you can still use Darktable, it's just that your changes will be final. We want to make sure all the colors match up and the white balance is correct. We also want to remove any chromatic aberration if we find any. Additionally, I added some lens corrections so any warping was reversed. Then I went out, selected copy parts, and made sure to select everything that we had worked on. Um, unfortunately, Darktable doesn't do this by itself, so just simply saying copy doesn't work. And then I applied that to all of the images. Then we export everything as a 16-bit TIFF or a PNG if you didn't shoot RAW. And then we can bring it into Meshroom. Honestly, the TIFFs are pretty big, so if you want to use a PNG, even if you shot with RAW, that also makes sense. I've experimented a lot with settings on Meshroom, and here is where a lot of the problems with this method occur. Meshroom cannot handle high density meshes and will create multiple materials for one object because it actually makes multiple textures the more dense a material is. If you were using Meshroom to create meshes to bake in Substance, this would be a big problem. Substance expects just one texture for the entirety of the mesh. Luckily, we are using Blender, so this is only kind of an inconvenience. However, we still want to make some changes to the settings and texturing. I've experimented with every setting you can use, and here are the best texturing settings I've found. Set the texture side length to 8K or 4K, depending on how big you want your final texture to be, and set the downscale to 1. Also set the output to TIFF or PNG, depending on your input. Now I'm going to quickly explain what we're doing in Blender before I actually show you how to do it. And I'm going to show you how the same procedures are commonly done in other software, if you want to do it in another software. We're going to import in a high poly mesh and create a low poly mesh to act as a frame that we will bake all the information onto. Since the terrain might have curves and bends on a larger scale we don't want to include, we need to make sure that we have the low poly mesh match those larger curves. In Blender, this is done through a modifier known as the shrink rub modifier and the subdivision modifier. In Blender, we are first going to make what I'm going to call the frame mesh fit the base mesh generally. This is because we want to make sure the frame mesh smoothly fits the larger curves in the terrain, but not so much that it causes us to have no high data to bake. In other software, you would then use this frame to calculate all the maps by shooting out rays from the frame. But in Blender, we use the multi-resolution modifier to fit the geometry of the frame mesh to the base mesh, and then Blender calculates the displacement and normal maps. Now let's finally actually get things started. Once everything is done, we need to make sure Blender can import our files. Go into Edit, Preferences, and then Add-ons, and make sure you have Import OBJs enabled. You should also make sure that you have the Node Wrangler add-on enabled since it's generally very useful for Blender and it's sort of an ease of life thing. Once you've enabled the plugin, you need to import a file labeled texturedmesh.obj in the texturing folder of the output folder Meshroom created wherever you saved your Meshroom project. One of the many pitfalls of using Blender for this is that often Blender, at least on my computer, gets clogged up and if you look on top it'll say not responding. Um, usually this is just because Blender is doing, I don't know why it says not responding, but basically the way to check if Blender really is actually working is by going into the task manager and looking at whether the CPU or, or the memory and RAM are actually doing anything. Uh, and if they are, usually that just means you have to be a little patient. First, I clean up the import. I delete any floating geometry by going into edit mode, selecting the main part of the model I want by pressing L, and then inverting my selection by pr pressing Control I. I then delete any floating or rogue geometry with X. Then, I rotate the object into place and use the box select tool to make a rough selection of the portion of the model I want to use for the bake. I again press Ctrl I and delete the excess geometry. We can now go into look dev mode or material preview mode to check our model and look at the textures that appear. What we're now going to do is produce a low poly plane that will be used to bake the textures onto. It'll bake the normal map, albedo map, displacement map, and ambient occlusion map. Unfortunately, we will have to fake the roughness map later since we have no data for this in the mesh or existing textures, but the normal albedo and AO maps will help us do this.
I add a plane, bring it up, press numpad 7, and then line it up and scale it down where I want it. Now I have to match the geometry of the high poly base mesh a little bit, since the surface is a little bit uneven. I go into edit mode, select all the edges, press shift E and type in 1. This marks a crease on all the edges so that when we subdivide the plane it remains a square. And then I'm going to go into the uh, modifier stack and add a subdivision node and a shrink wrap modifier just so that it matches the general shape of the terrain before we make sure that we use the multi-resolution modifier. So what you're going to see is that the edges are going to be a little bit jagged in, and we will need to fix this or else when we try to apply the texture onto another object, there will be distortions. So what we're going to need to do is going to change the wrap method to project and then the uh, and then select negative. You're also going to need to make sure that the target is the targeted mesh uh, just so that it'll follow that curve. I then go to the modifiers tab and add a multi-resolution modifier and a shrink wrap modifier. In the shrink wrap modifier, I select the base mesh as the target and I also set the wrap method to project and select negative. In the multi-resolution modifier, press subdivide a couple times, then set the viewport and render to something that's more manageable so that your viewport isn't as laggy. Apply the shrink wrap modifier with control A in object mode and then drag the projected mesh up until you can't see the mesh below it. Click on the projected mesh or you know the low poly mesh and add a new material. In this material, add an image texture node and create a new texture called bake, which is the resolution you want the final texture to be. Make sure to plug this into the principled BSDF. Once that's done, if you're using raw images, go into the materials for the base meshes, which should be labeled as I think atlases, and then make sure that the color management for all the textures is set to raw. If you don't do this, then the bake will appear darker than it should. Now we're reaching the end. Go to the render properties, make sure you're in cycles, and then go to the bake tab so we can start baking maps one by one. First, let's bake the albedo, color, diffuse, whatever you want to call it. Select the bake type to diffuse, and under influence, deselect direct and indirect lighting since we don't want those lights to affect the color. We just want the color. Select selected to active, set the max ray distance to something like 0.2 meters, and now select the base mesh, and then shift select the low poly mesh. Click bake and wait till it's done. Once that's finished, inspect the bake in image editor and make sure that it all looks correct. Then save the file as a 16-bit RGBA TIFF or as a PNG. Now let's do the ambient occlusion. Select the bake type as ambient occlusion, select the base mesh, and then shift select the low poly mesh. Click bake and wait till it's done. Once that's finished, inspect the bake in the image editor and make sure all of it looks correct. Then save the image as a 16-bit RGBA TIFF or as a PNG. Now let's move on to the normal map. For the normal map and displacement map, we'll be using bake from multi-res. Select bake from multi-res and then use the bake type normals. Now just select the projected mesh, the mesh that we have a multi-resolution modifier in, and press bake. Once that's finished, inspect the bake in image editor and make sure it all looks correct. Then save the image as a 16-bit RGBA TIFF blah 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 blah. Now let's finish the baking off with the displacement. Select the bake type as displacement and select the projected mesh again. Wait for the bake to finish and look at the output. Once that's finished, inspect the bake in the image editor and make sure it all looks correct. Then save the image as a 16-bit RGB TIFF or as a PNG. Now that you have a normal map, an AO map, and an albedo map, we can create the roughness map. For now, unplug the bake texture node and set it to the side. Add the textures you created, but don't plug them into anything yet. Now add a color ramp and plug the albedo into it. In the real world, often lighter objects are shinier than darker objects, and we're going to use this to fake roughness. Using a trick I picked up from Gregor Chbaran, who's a really good YouTuber, if you like this texturing tutorial, you should watch his. His are much more professional than mine, and he uses a lot more interesting tricks. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of his uh, software is paid, but you know, it, it'll teach you a lot. Uh, anyway, back to the trick. We can multiply the fake roughness by the blue channel of the normal map and the AO to try and make sure that the roughness maps have more detail. This is because deeper parts of objects, you know, crevices, are often more diffused when they're textured and the blue channel correlates to the Z and the AO um, is really just the crevices of a texture.
Since in a roughness map, the white is fully diffused and the black is completely shiny, we need to invert the output from what we have right now. And now we have a good enough roughness map. Of course, this isn't perfect and uh, there are other tricks you can learn to fix this, but this should work for most textures. Now make sure you plug all your textures in, so plug the albedo into the color, plug the normal into the normal, the dif displacement into the displacement, use the AO, and then in the look dev, see if the roughness looks correct. You want to make sure the ground doesn't look too wet, so you should adjust the color ramp so that everything looks like how it would look in real life, and if you have things like leaves that you'd want to be shinier than the dirt in the background, make sure that the leaves have some shine. Now to bake the roughness, we just plug the bake texture back into the diffuse, and in the bake tab, select roughness. Uncheck Selected to Active if it's still enabled, and then in the Node tree, select the Roughness Texture node before pressing Bake. Now that we're done with Blender, we need to tile our textures and make sure that they're seamless. That's where GIMP comes in, so let's open up GIMP and load all of our textures. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, GIMP does not allow us to use the Clone Step tool on several layers at once like Substance Painter, so we are forced to let it op automate the process. Luckily, if you are doing a texture that has lots of small detail from nature, it works quite well due to the amount of randomness. Now you might notice in my example, there are some areas that are darker than others, and when this tiles, it will be very noticeable. Luckily, there is a way to equalize or homogenize the brightness of a texture in GIMP. First, take the albedo texture we created and create a duplicate of it. Then go to Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur, and set it to something between 20 to 40 pixels. Then go to Color Invert, Colors Desaturate, and finally set the Blend Mode to Overlay. This does a pretty good job equalizing the colors and makes sure that the texture looks better when it's tiled. Once that's done, all you have to do is actually tile it. All you have to do is go to each image and select Filters, Map, Tile, Seamless. You can then export all the images and you should now have a seamless image. If any of you know any plugins for GIMP that allow you to use the clone step tool on multiple layers, or you know any software that is like a good substance alternative, please let me know and again, I will make an update. I hope you guys enjoyed watching and I hope my method allowed a lot of you to have more creative flexibility with your scenes. If you did enjoy watching my video, please consider liking and subscribing because I really did put a lot of effort into making this. In addition, if anyone had any criticisms or any ideas or they saw any mistakes, please let me know. I'll make any updates as necessary. If you have any questions, again, please let me know. I will make sure to read everything and try to answer any questions as best as I can. Thank you.